Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Brackett. My day job is I'm a professor at Yale University in the Child Studies Center, and I'm the founder and director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and the author of the book, Permission to Feel. Super excited to be with you on your last day at ASU GSV. I'm gonna share my screen so we can go through a presentation. On the bottom are my social media handles and websites if you'd like to follow up or get any information from me. How about we start with a nice long inhale? Stretch out your shoulders a little bit. I know that a lot of you have been staring at the screen for a while. Take a nice inhale and an exhale. Just give yourself a second to come into the zone. I'm gonna begin my presentation with a poem by Haruki Murakami. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. If you could just take a moment, think about how does that quote resonate with you right here, right now, during these pretty stressful times? What comes up for you? What does it make you think about? I have the opportunity to run a center of 60 people. We are a team of scientists and practitioners who have one major goal, which is to help people get through this really, really challenging storm -zuh. As we now know, COVID-19 has brought out a lot in our society, from tremendous anxiety to social unrest, um, along with fires, um, we've got some challenges to deal with. And our goal is to use the power of our emotions to create a healthier and more equitable, innovative, and compassionate society. So over the last six months, we've done about four studies with over 15,000 people across the United States of America and around the world. But this is the state of emotional affairs right now. How many of you can relate to that? Just one big puddle, lake, ocean of anxiety. No matter where we go with leaders of corporations, teachers, students, anxiety seems to be the number one emotion. When we ask kids how they're feeling, what we find is that slightly more granular, frustrated, bored, anxious, confused, lonely, sad. And so when you go to think about our emotional lives, it seems as if we're, we're really out of emotional balance, don't you think? This is a tool we call the mood meter, which helps to plot our different feeling states. And I'll talk more about that later. But it looks like a lot of us are living in that red and blue space. I know I've been living there a lot. A lot of people think the goal has got to be to be happy all the time. Has anyone here struggled with being happy over the last couple of months? Um, I've tried reading these articles on happiness, and every time I read them, I get more and more disappointed and annoyed and irritated and even full of despair because it's like there's a real reason to be anxious right now. And so the question that we have is, what's the goal with our feelings? Is it to get rid of all that red and blue and try to just experience that yellow and the green? The problem is that it doesn't really work. That's why I wrote a book that I call Permission to Feel. Let's think about that right now. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to you as a person who works in technology in the nonprofit sector, corporate education? What does it mean to have permission to feel? What words come up for you? What does it make you think about? Do you feel like you can be your true feeling self in every context that you're in, at home, at school, at work? Or do you think there are factors that get in the way of you being your authentic, true feeling self. When you're designing products, are you taking this concept of people having the permission to feel in the product seriously? So it's interesting. I was interviewed the other day and I was telling someone about my story. I had terrible abuse in my childhood and um, I didn't have the permission to feel as a kid. I had the permission to suppress, repress, deny, act out, eat, everything but feel. And I saw the person getting very uncomfortable with me and everybody's like, well, what about the research? What about the research? And it just was another awakening for me 
about our world's discomfort with vulnerability, with talking about feeling. But there is science. Of course, there's science. I wouldn't have a center otherwise. Emotions are the drivers of our attentional capacity. How you feel right now is driving whether or not you're paying attention to my presentation. Are you engaged or are you disengaged? Emotions are the drivers of your decision making. Has anyone here made a bad choice over the last couple of months? It's probably because you were emotionally depleted. Emotions are the drivers of our relationship quality. Think about it. Emotions are signals to approach or avoid. Our physical and mental health, our performance and creativity. A few things about COVID. What we know, 67% increase in adults' experience of distress. About a 40% increase in kids externalizing, externalizing behaviors. And we know there has been tremendous impact on our BIPOC community, our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, and such that the mortality rate among Black individuals is about three times higher than in white individuals. And that leads to you know, some interesting questions about our society. Are we a society that's filled with emotion scientists or emotion judges? People who are open and curious and reflective or people who are closed and critical and judgmental? I've come to the conclusion in my research that there really are these different types of people out there. The people who are open and curious and who want to get granular about their feelings, like, are you stressed or are you overwhelmed? Are you angry or are you disappointed? Are you envious or are you jealous? What's the difference between and among all these emotions? And there are people who just like, I feel like shit, I'm fine. And they just want to move on. They don't even want to ask you how you're feeling because they don't really want to listen to what you have to say and they don't necessarily know what to do when you tell them. And they have a fixed mindset. Think about that. Like, my father had that. Son, like, this is how I deal with my anger. Learn how to deal with it. I learned how to deal with it 10 years in therapy and 25 years as an emotion scientist. That leads us to the skills. What are the underlying skills that we all need to develop to be those emotion scientists? Think about it. Recognizing your own and others' emotions accurately, understanding their causes and consequences, labeling them with precise words knowing how and when to express your emotions. Think about that. How we express our emotions varies as a function of many things, our culture, our race, our gender, our power status, regulating emotions. What are the strategies that we use to help us manage our feelings? And during these uncertain and stressful times, people have asked us, well, what are the strategies? Here are seven of my top strategies. The first is you gotta give yourself the permission to feel. People say, Mark, have you been actually like anxious? I worry about why I worry, and I even worry about why I worry about why I worry. And I decided to just let it be. There's uncertainty, there's unpredictability, there's lack of control. My control needs, by the way, maybe they're like yours, have gone out of control. Like, I want to control what people think, what they eat, when they speak. It's like crazy. Anything to have control because the world around me has no control. So the question is, can you give yourself that permission to be your true, full feeling self? And rem remember that there's no such thing as a bad emotion. We have to learn how to manage our physiology. When we're activated, our sympathetic nervous system kind of pumps out cortisol, which makes it hard to focus. It makes it hard to find the language. So we got to do those breathing exercises, do some mindfulness, but it's insufficient, right? We've got to take care of ourselves. We know that that there are factors like sleep and nutrition and exercise that contribute to our healthy or unhealthy emotion regulation. Are you doing things you enjoy? Taking that little five minute walk, healthy relationships, staying connected. What I know from my research with children is that about two thirds of America's youth don't believe there's an adult in their school who is there to support them. That doesn't require a major intervention. Think about it. What's your self-talk like been lately? Anyone been a self-saboteur over the last couple of months? I can't take it anymore, I'm gonna lose it. I had my mother-in-law living with us. She came for a week in March, right before all flights to Panama got canceled for seven months. I can tell you, uh, managing thoughts has become um, one of my favorite things to do, and it's been hard. How much of us had training in switching our 
negative self-talk to positive self-talk? And then are we doing the routines and rituals that are working for us? Are we structuring our lives in ways that are helping us to manage our emotions effectively? I spent most of my career trying to figure out how to do systemic change. There's so much content out there. Isn't there? You've probably seen these webinars, like five tips to this and the PDF of that and a toolkit for that. And when you really get into the research, what you find is that there's no impact. You know, you can't fix your mental health with a toolkit, right? You can't learn strategies on how to manage your life, you know, in a PDF, right? We have to think about this in a systemic way. And so what does that mean? Well, without getting too granular with all of you, right? Our strategy with schools in particular is one that's comprehensive. It's about all the adults learning. It's about school-wide tools from preschool to high school, having an online platform that supports teachers and implementing, monitoring, evaluating. Every stakeholder's got to be involved. It's about leading, teaching, learning as students, and parenting as caregivers. But here's what I want to focus on, these four things. One, mindsets. So are you an emotion scientist? Or are you an emotion judge? Might you be the judge with some people and the scientist with others? Are you deepening those skills? Are you that person who has a growth mindset like, yes, I really messed up regulating today, but tomorrow I'm going to get back on that saddle and try better strategies. What about the organizational climate and culture of your organization? If I were to ask you, what are the three words that would describe the emotional climate of your office, of your school, of your home, what would they be? And finally, whether it be a school or a workplace, what are the policies? What are the, what's the pedagogy in schools? Um, and is that aligned with these core principles of emotional intelligence? And what we find is that's when you get the impact. So just to give you quick examples, our work is adult personal professional development, student learning, preschool to high school, out of school time, and also for families. There's curriculum at every grade level from preschool all the way to high school. So building that muscle, that vocabulary, learning those strategies across time. Imagine what it's like. Think about the brain of a child who has had a comprehensive emotion education versus a child who's in a school that doesn't take their emotions seriously. That's an equity issue in my opinion. I argue there's too many rules, not enough feelings. How do you want to feel? Think about that in your workplace, in your home. Why not ask people that question and create environments where feelings are first? Build that language. Here's our mood meter. Get granular, get specific. You got to name it to tame it. These are children and adults using this throughout the world. We even have an app that we built called the Mood Meter app to help people manage and understand their feelings. Last thing I want to say is that there's a lot of research to support this work. And you can check that out on our websites, which I'll share in a minute. We have a workplace solution called Emotion Life Lab. You can check that out. And I just want to end by saying, one, you got to give yourself the permission to feel. Strive to be that scientist, not the judge. Build the skills. Be the role model. Focus on systemic change. And maybe we can create that society we all care about. And on that note, I say thank you for inviting me. And I hereby grant all of you permission to feel.